prepare ourselves for worship by joining in confession, emptying out the stagnant pride and, and self-righteousness, and uh, preparing ourselves to thirst and hunger for God's word and God's love. So I invite you to uh, join in confession. Rise and pray with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you, thought, word, and deed, by what you have done and by what you have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and heal us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace, that where there is hatred, we may sow love, where there is injury, pardon, and where there is despair, hope. Grant, O oh divine Master, that we may seek to console, to understand, and to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. First lesson is from the book of Genesis, the 45th chapter. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Here hence the first reading. Amen. Thank Thank God. God. Please join me in reading our psalm responsibly as printed in the bulletin. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. For they shall be like the grass, and like, and like the green grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Take the wife in the Lord, you shall give you your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. <clears throat> Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. The Lord will make it. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. Refrain from anger, be rage alone. Do not be provoked, but he is only The evildoers shall be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. In a little while, the wicked shall be no more. Even if you search out their place, they will not be there. But the lowly shall possess the land. They will delight in the abundance of peace. But the deliverance of the righteous comes from you, O oh Lord. You are their stronghold in time of trouble. You, O oh Lord, will help them and rescue them. You will rescue them from the wicked and deliver them, because in you they seek refuge. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. 
So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. follows on Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. Jesus continues, But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and when, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ.
Let's pray. Lord, bless these words that I speak. May each of us hear your word given to feed the hungry, to parch the thirst of the thirsty, to heal the broken. Bless this time. Bless these holy lives as your children we pray. Last week you heard part of the Sermon on the Plain, Luke chapter 6, which is a parallel to Matthew chapter 5, which is what we more, we're more familiar with, Sermon on the Mount, and all of its blessings. I think in, in Matthew there are eight blessings. Luke has a, a similar, again, Sermon on the Plain, um, but there's only four or five blessings, and then Luke has the four or five woes, warnings. Most people liked the Sermon on the Mount better because it's all good news. It's all blessings. If you're hurt, God will help. If you're in sorrow, you know, God will help. And we all hunger and seek God's help. But in Luke's version, we hear those woes and warnings. And, and we're not as comfortable because we know some of that applies to us. Sometimes we're feeling okay. We're doing okay. Sometimes we are happy and laughing and we know there's others who are struggling for another day of life. And so I think a lot of Christians are less comfortable with, with Luke's version and, and uh, so we just stay with the uh, Sermon on the Mount and enjoy God's blessings. And whether it was the same sermon that was just remembered differently because the Bible wasn't written until 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus died. Or whether Jesus preached a similar sermon different times, different places, as we preachers are prone to do. The message of God is there for us, whether it's two versions of the same day or whether it's two different times. God is trying to remind us and tell us. Things will be right in the end. God's justice will ultimately prevail. And God's way of love will ultimately overcome the human way of power and influence and competition. In these words today, some of these are good and we just we draw to them. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be good? Again and love and peace, and yet we also say, Lord, what you're asking is impossible for us humans. Love your enemies? We've been taught all our lives, you love your friends, you hate your enemies. You put on your guard and, and you strike back and you make sure your enemies don't get the best of you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, Lord, it's one thing if you're eternal and you know that you, you'll be here forever, you'll outlast your opponents, but for us mortals, it's hard. It's impossible when our own mortal life is at stake. If one strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. For anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Here, I think Jesus has God's radical answer to a lot of crime, theft. There's no theft if you give the person what they want. But that goes against all that we've been taught, all that we think, all our logic, all our the system of punishment. Reward and punishment, that's how we raise our children, that's how we teach our students, that's how we run our businesses. You reward the good behavior, you punish the bad behavior, and thereby try to move people towards the right stuff and away from the wrong stuff. But God knows that love is more powerful than reward or punishment. 
It's more powerful, but it sometimes takes longer, and we humans are short-sighted. We want everything now, fast food, fast entertainment, fast everything. And love sometimes takes more than a lifetime to change the heart of a person. More than our lifetime. So God is calling us to sow seeds of love, to live lives of love, to live as if we are children of God, to live the way our daddy does, even though we also know that our bodies, our lives, we are going to die. And we want to see justice in our time. We want to see the evil pay the price. We want to see those wrongdoers pay the price now. Because that's part of the, the human predicament. We approach life from our self perspective. Self preservation. Self promotion. Self What's good for me? What's going to help me be better, be better off, feel better? And so we do those good things that we'll get rewarded for, and we try to avoid those bad things that we'll get punished for because it's in our own self-interest. But it all goes back to selfishness. And it's kind of like our American system, you know, of government and of economics. Uh, our founders were wise enough to know we're not going to get rid of selfishness and self-centeredness and self-interest. Let's use it. Let's use self-interest and balance different groups and, and end up having everyone's self-interest promote us into the, the better future. But when you found a system on sin, on the sin of selfishness, Sooner or later, it's going to get corrupted, and different people's selfishness and different groups' selfishness is going to try to stomp down your enemies. We try to take advantage of each other. How to be opportunistic. When we're buying something, we look for the lowest price. When we're selling something, we want the highest price. With no concern for what's a just price. Or how much that person needs it. Or how much it's going to help that person's life. None of that comes into price or cost. Love your enemies. Now when Jesus talks about love and when Paul talks about love and, and whenever we see love in scripture, we don't see the kind of modern romantic love or, or love is just peace and, and be nice. There are different kinds of love in Greek, different words, seven different types of love in Greek. And in Hebrew, there are a couple different words that are translated as love, and they mean different things, but most of them mean a lot more than just a nice feeling of, oh, be nice. Love is usually an effort, an, an energy, an activity. Care. Care for that person. Have compassion, which means suffer with them. A lot of times when people do nasty things, they're doing it out of their own hurt or greed or pride. And maybe if we cared enough about them to wonder why did they do that wrong thing, maybe we'd find a different way to handle it rather than punishing. Sometimes punishment is the best thing. Sometimes we humans only respond to reward and punishment. But sometimes a caring person can get through to a person who's all confused and mixed up and doing all the wrong stuff and can help turn their life around. Sometimes God's love can get in there and turn a life around. 
Hasn't God done that for each of us? Most Christians love the song Amazing Grace. You know, how sweet the sound saved a wretch like me, but I don't think most of us really want to stay in touch with that sense that we were wretches, that we were as selfish as the other person. We like to think we're better than that. We're better than the other person. And in so doing, we take God's throne of judgment. Who's right and who's wrong? Who's better and who's worse? Jesus wants us to give up all that. Just love. Don't love so that you get love back. Don't love so that you get the credit for changing a person's life. No, just love because God loves. And as God's children, we're called to copy Daddy. To do what Daddy does. How did Daddy deal with this situation? How did Daddy deal with this person, this sinner, this wrongdoer? Now, God does punish. But let's leave that up to God. Because our judgment so often is wrong. We make snap judgments. And we end up punishing the wrong people or the wrong way or the wrong thing. Do not judge and you will not be judged. God tells us that in so many different ways in the scripture. Jesus tells us that in different ways, different places. But deep down, we've learned from, from childhood on to make judgments, to judge what's good and bad, right and wrong. That morality of right and wrong that God would rather not have us have. If God didn't want Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because then they would learn to judge him. And God knew that human judgment was so imperfect, it would get things all messed up. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. And there's also the truth that, that social scientists are, are learning and, and publishing that when you're angry with someone, when you hold that grudge, you're hurting yourself as much as them. You're probably even more. That anger inside, that, that rage, that desire to get even, that's causing you stress. Maybe cancer or maybe other problems. And while love is a harder work, it's easier on the body and the spirit. Well, we, we like to hear the good stuff from God, and, and we have trouble with some of the harder stuff that Jesus says. And so on this, again, our common response is, Jesus, what you're asking us to do is impossible. It sounds nice. We like it. We'll check it off, you know, so we can pass the test. We love your enemy. But to do it? can't really expect us to do it. After today's passage, and later in the chapter, um, Jesus asks, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Again, our human judgment, we're, we're better at finding everyone else's mistakes. We're blind to our own. Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take the speck out of your, of your eye when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. And that Greek word hypocrite that Jesus used with the Pharisees and other occasions um, shocked the listeners. Because the Pharisees and, and what people are doing that Jesus is trying to criticize it, all they do is criticize people. They, they, they're hypocrites, Jesus. You use the wrong Greek word. They're hypocrites. They're too critical. But their sin wasn't being too critical. The Pharisees who were critical of everyone, their sin was being hypocritical, not critical enough of themselves. And that's where most of us humans are hypocrites. 
hypocrites. We're not critical enough of ourselves. We're all too critical of everyone else. Whoever else goes over the line, we want to catch them and make them pay a lesson. But we're hypocrites, hypocrites. We're not critical enough of ourselves. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And then just a paragraph later, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone looks is like who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply, laid a foundation on a rock, and when a flood arose, the river burst against that house but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like the man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, immediately it fell, and great was the ruin of that house. That's the price of listening and saying, oh, that sounds good, Jesus, but not trying to live it out in our lives. Oh yeah, God, your love is good. We're glad for your love. Thank you for loving me. But don't expect me to go out and love my neighbor my enemy, with that other person who, who's done wrong to me, or that group, and, and we're great on groups in our society, and we divide ourselves into groups, and our group is always the good guys, and it's that other group that is our enemy. But if that's how we're going to live, let's learn to love our enemy and understand them. Can't we be different from each other and still love one another? Do we have to try to be the same or make the other person or group like us? When I first came to Carlisle for my first call in 1987, and uh, we moved in uh, about a year, we were in an apartment and then we moved to our house. Uh, and the one pastor to really welcome me and greet me was your pastor at the time, Larry Cummings. And he and I would visit each other a couple times. Sometimes kids in tow and our wives were at work, you know, and we'd visit each other. Not often, but a couple of times. And we were different. He was as conservative as I am liberal. I mean, we were just philosophically, politically, even theologically, kind of really at different ends of the spectrum. But we liked each other. We, 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 we wanted to be with each other, just share and learn from each other without having to try, try to change each other. Does our society have any relationships like that anymore? Or do we seek out the like-minded people and hang with them? And those others, well, we'll just not deal with them. There is an effort to loving our enemy. But there can be some blessings in it, too. And think of God loving us while we were still sinners. And look what we've done to this earth God gave us, how we humans have trashed the place. We've had a big party and and polluted the air and the water and the soil and we dumped stuff and we hurt each other and we've spilled blood and, and yet my father still wants us to come home. Still loves us. Love is a powerful thing. And I think each of us has seen glimpses in our lives where We've been loved by that kind of love. Or when God has worked through us to love someone else and, and we, we hopefully have seen enough of that to energize us, to seek more of it. The effort of love. Loving and understanding and making ourselves vulnerable. But knowing that sometimes it comes at a price. Sometimes we get hurt. But it's not necessarily just or fair or right to love the person who's hurting us. That is maybe humanly impossible. But maybe God can help with that. 
When we can't love, let's at least work for justice, fairness, not over-punishing. Jesus tells us a lot of hard stuff. But knows that we can take it and knows that we can do it with God's help, with the Spirit at work in us. May God bless each of us to be able to really hear all that God is telling us and to be able to do what God wants us to do. More of the time, we'll never be able to do it always not on this side of our mortality. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, continue to shape us with your love. Strengthen us, heal us, and help us to pass on that same love to others. Thank you for the gift of love, for without it, this world would be a whole lot different. And we thank you for the vision of the future world, when love is the ruler all in all. Help us through this in-between time, our Lord, we pray, as your children, in Jesus' name. our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. You teach us to love our neighbors and enemies alike. Encourage your church to follow the leading of your love, especially when it is risky or difficult. Help us to show mercy just as we have first received mercy. God of grace, hear our prayers. Nurture fields that lie dormant, resting until it is time to bloom again. Bless farmers and all who cultivate fields and urban gardens. Give favorable weather for planting. Bring forth from buried seed an abundant harvest and guard against famine and disease. God of grace, Look upon our world with mercy, that we delight in an abundance of peace. Protect all whose lives are marred by war and civil unrest. Release political prisoners and amplify the voices that challenge us to seek forgiveness and pursue nonviolence. God of grace, hear our prayers. Your people cry out for mercy. Console hearts that long for forgiveness. Mend broken relationships. Heal bodies that suffer with chronic pain or illness. Strengthen and deliver all whose spirits are troubled, especially those who we name in our hearts. God of 
grace you bind us together into one family. Teach us to forgive one another and to resolve conflicts with humility and patience. Bless families of all shapes and sizes and show love to those who are lonely for thee. God of grace. Amen. We bring to you the other petitions silently or aloud. Amen. God of grace, hear our prayer. We praise you for the saints who have inherited the fullness of your kingdom. As you have raised them to imperishable and eternal life, sustain us in faith by the promise of resurrection. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and in faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also, and also with you. you. And our sharing of the peace is meant to be practiced. Hopefully, when we leave this place, we try to share God's love and peace with whoever we meet the rest of this day and week. But let us take a moment to uh, share some signs of peace with one another.
betrayed, took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us join our hearts and voices with Christians of all times in the prayer as written. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Christ has built a table with more than enough for all. Let us join in taking the bread of life, knowing that the body of Christ is given for us in his fulfillment. <laughs> Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Shall we sing the Agnes Day Lamb of God? Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. with favor and fill you with his peace and love. 